Good morning. Storms occur when two weather systems collide, and they produce, well, there's really two things about them. Storms happen. We can't avoid them. And secondly, dangerous energy can be produced by storms. Uh, you have to learn to weather them. We're going to talk in a couple of weeks, strength for the storms of life, because storms happen when the will of um, mates collide. We'll talk about marital storms. Storms happen when the will of parents hit the will of kids. It creates a lot of energy. Happens at work. The will of a boss and the will of an employee collide, creates storms. How do you weather these things? Sometimes you don't even need to be with somebody else. We have storms within us. We want this and we want that, and these collide, and, and we live with storms, and learning to weather those things is what strength for the storms of life will be about. We'll start that series that's going to happen in September and October in a couple of weeks. But for this week, we're concluding our summer to remember, and we've saved the best for last, in a way. We're going to put a couple of verses together, and we're going to remember them. And they'll speak to us what God would want to say to us, and I think they'll comfort us at the deepest part of ourselves. There we go. Be still and know that I am God. Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. I'm going to want you to put those two things together. Let's practice it a couple times. If you put them together, they say volumes. Be still and know that I am God. Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. You try it. See, it kind of, they, they kind of play on one another. They talk about be still and know that I'm God. And then, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Say it one more time. These are the verses that I'd like you to remember in, as we conclude our, our summer to remember. In the sheet in your worship folder, it says, God is our refuge and strength, a very an ever-present help in trouble. Then it goes on toward the end of that psalm to say, be still and know that I am God. God is an ever-present help in trouble. Um, that's bad news and good news. It's bad news to those of us who can use what we have to insulate ourselves from problems and troubles. And I imagine that there's some people who feel that they are insulating themselves from troubles and problems because what God says, I am a very ever-present help in trouble. And there's some things that God can only do for us and in us when we're in the middle of difficulties. It's a place that he meets us. If our life is going smoothly, we don't have any troubles, frankly, we don't really need God. And we don't connect with him to the degree that we do so in the midst of circumstances that aren't exactly what we would want. What it says, God is an ever-present help in trouble. So it's, it's bad news for us who are able to leverage what we have to stay out of trouble, but I don't imagine that's many of us that we usually find that we're not able to keep troubles and problems at bay, no matter how much we pray, no matter how good people we are, no matter how good our family is. And so the good news for us is that um, God can meet us in that context, and that's when he's an ever-present help. Then it goes on to describe the kind of trouble that God meets us in, in natural disasters. It says in the psalm, though the earth give way, and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam. We see that in storms. You know, we have the images of Katrina and tsunami, the impact, the devastating impact of raging, agitated waters and what they can do to landscape, to people. Uh, what it's saying in the middle of natural disasters, God says, I'm an ever-present help. Be still and know that I am God, even though there's earthquakes, things, there's cataclysmic events happening in terms of nature. That's not an easy lesson to learn, really. Um, it wasn't easy for the disciples. They had a, an occasion, uh, something happened. Follow along, I'll read it. A furious squall came up. The waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. That's a pretty good trick. 
the disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to the disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? In the middle of a storm, when the sea was raging, they were in the middle of a violent storm, he wanted them to be still. And I imagine them being fishermen, knowing about the storms that occur in this place. Be still, what a ridiculous thing to ask. We're in the middle of a hurricane. Obviously, Jesus, you don't understand hurricanes, so why don't you go back to your nap, and we'll take care of things on the boat. Uh, Be still, who in the world does he think he is? You know, sometimes I really don't get Jesus. You know, he seems really caring sometimes. We're in the middle of a storm, wants us to be still. Sleep on the cushion. Um, And then he says, he gets up and says, be still. And the sea quiets. And the wind stops. Then he turns back to them, having said to the storms, be still. Now, be still. Because, as he showed them, I am God. I'm bigger than storms. Um, Natural disasters are a context in which he would have us be still and know that he is God. Not just natural disasters, but social disasters as well. It describes nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall in that same psalm. Not only are there natural disasters happening, but there are social disasters. Kingdoms conflicting with one another. Some of you perhaps have served in the military, and you know the chaos that exists in the middle of a war when nations are in conflict with each with one another. I know some of you have children that are in the middle of conflict, have been in the middle of conflict. Social disasters are a difficult context in which to be still and know that he is God. There is a story from the Old Testament, and again, follow along. It's about e- Elisha. When the servant of the man of God, he was Elisha. Elisha had a nasty habit of telling the king of Israel, when the king of Aram was going to attack him and where. So the king of Aram would enter into this battle strategy. We're going to attack Israel here. We'll capture them there. And then God would tell Elisha, the king of Aram is going to attack the king of Israel here and there. So the king of Aram thinks it's his people that are Uh, spreading the news, and that are traitors. And then he learns, no, it's not that. There is this prophet. God tells him everything. It's like God's listening to what's happening in our tent. And so then they say, okay, we've got to kill Elisha. So they go to the place where he is, Dothan, and they have an army that surrounds this city. The servant of Elisha gets up in the morning, and let's hit the narrative. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh, my Lord, what should we do, the servant asked. And then Elisha says, don't be afraid. The prophet answered. And Elisha prayed, oh, Lord, open his eyes so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And in a sense, in the middle of a social disaster, uh, God was saying, be still, know that I'm God. Be still, what a ridiculous thing to ask. We're in the middle of a war. Be still, who, does, who in the world does he think he is? Sometimes I don't know him. God says, be still and know that I am God. Open the servant's eyes and sees, holy smokes. You know, I could see all the natural forces, but I couldn't see supernatural forces. And then when he saw that, he wasn't afraid anymore because he could see that God was there as well. Be still and know that I am God when there's natural disasters, when there's social disasters. He promises there's supernatural deliverance. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. When the dust clears, nations will not be able to contravene what I want to happen. Neither will natural disasters. So you can be still. Because I will be God, God says. And I am not threatened, nor is my will put out of sorts by natural disasters. I am not challenged by them, nor is God challenged when kingdoms rise against kingdoms. We can be still. 
In times of danger, though, other strategies seem more appealing. When there's mortal danger, uh, look in the worship folder. There is uh, an account from the book of Isaiah in which they are being confronted by the Assyrian army that has marched and devastated the whole country, and now they've come to the capital. They have machines that they are going to have a siege against the city. They're going to erect these battlements around it. They're going to starve them, and then they're going to kill them. And they have done this throughout the whole land. This is the last place that they have to conquer. They are in mortal danger. And they respond. Well, let's look and see how they respond. And you looked in that day when they hear the Assyrians are coming, You looked in that day to the weapons in the palace of the forest. You saw that the city of David had many breaches in its defenses. So, here's their response. You stored up water in the lower pool. You counted the buildings in Jerusalem and tore down houses to strengthen the wall. You built a reservoir between the two walls for the water of the old pool. But you did not look to the one who made it or have regard for the one who planned it long ago. Elbow grease. And that is a strategy. Now, certainly we need to respond to dangerous situations. But what God's concern here is they hear about this danger, and they know it's dangerous, and it was. There's no doubting the fact that the Assyrian army had done some serious damage, and they're right at the doorsteps. And so they respond with elbow grease. They roll up their sleeves. Okay, this is what we've got to do. The wall's not really strong. Let's repair it. You, let's put water in between the walls so that we have a water source because they're going to try to cut it off. And if they cut off our water source from outside, we're going to die of thirst. Let's take care of the water issue. And so they're, you know, snap. Let's get to it. We don't have much time. And what God says, you were faced with a problem, but there was no stillness at all. You didn't even talk to me about it. You had no regard for the one who puts kingdoms in place, who controls the weather, who controls human events. Why didn't you talk to me about this? Somebody must have got the message. Because what happened? The emissary for the Assyrian king shouts things to the people on the wall, you're going to die, you've had it, What? look at your land, your land is completely destroyed. And then Hezekiah, the king, goes before God, he spreads a letter that the king of Assyria has sent saying, you're toast. He doesn't have any means wherewith to resist now. He's done all the elbow greasing that he can do. So he spreads this letter before God, and finally we get somebody who is still, comes before God, and honestly says, God, we're in a lot of trouble. Here's what this guy is saying, and here's what he's going to do. We are in mortal danger. And here's what happens. Here's what God responds through Isaiah. Because you have prayed to me, about Sennacherib, king of Assyria, this is the word the Lord has spoken. I will defend this city and save it. Goes on. Then that evening, the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 men in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. History records that there was a plague that broke out in the Assyrian camp, put 186,000 Assyrians to death. Overnight, what ends up happening, the emissary goes back and the king that has threatened his kids kill him and the strength of the Assyrian kingdom is overturned overnight. They had come to the end of what they could do through elbow grease. And what God says, talk to me about it. Be still. Sure, you're going to have to conceive of some strategies. Be still first, then move forward and strategize and plan. Because when you talk to me about things, there's things that I can do. Why? He says, be still and know that I am God. I am God. And that's what he would tell us, I think. Be still. But look at there. But look at there. There's things that... Look at my kids. Be still. 
But, but look, at my, look at the bank. I can't, I, you know, if, if I don't do this here, that's going to happen. If I don't do this here, we, you know, we're going to be in a... Be still. Be still. Be still. <laughs> and know that I'm God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Who do you think I am? I command storms. I am the one who planned everything. Sure, there's some things that you're going to have to do. I'm not going to allow you, God says, to sit back. But what I'm going to ask you to do first when you're confronted by things that are dangerous is what? You tell me the verse now. One more time. When you're confronted by troubles, what I would recommend, let that verse circulate through your head. You see things you don't want that threaten you, that threaten your family, that threaten our nation, that threaten your welfare, that threaten your kids. Be still and know that I am God. And that leads to talking to him about things rather than just elbow grease. There's mortal danger that we respond with elbow grease. Sometimes it's not... Mortal danger, it's moral danger. Look what happens. It says, her officials within her, in your worship, in the, in the sheet, her officials within her are like wolves tearing their prey. It's talking about the moral conditions of Israel. These were the children of God, and it's just going to describe what the officials were like and what the people were like. Take a look. Her officials within her are like wolves tearing their prey. They shed blood and kill people to make unjust gain. They go to, they stop at nothing in order to pad their pockets, even when it's denying justice to those who deserve it. Uh, It goes on, her prophets whitewash these deeds for them by false and lying divinations. They say, this is what the sovereign Lord says, when the Lord has not spoken. The people of the land practice extortion and commit robbery. They oppress the poor and needy and mistreat the alien, denying them justice. It's describing a situation where their moral conditions were deplorable. Deplorable. And you look around and see, well, there's things in our nation that are like that. People stomping over the needy in order to be able to get what they want, not really caring about people in Africa, or even people in our own country. We deal with these moral evils as well. They plague us. And what the prophets at that time were doing, it wasn't elbow grease, it was whitewash. You know what whitewash is? If you have a breach in your, in your wall, you're in a city, the city is protected by a wall, and there's cracks in the wall that need to be repaired. And to repair the cracks will take some work what they would do is whitewash them. Take a thin coat of plaster and just put the plaster on the outside of the crack so from appearances, it looks like the wall is solid. Yep, solid wall. Don't, don't touch it there. <laughs> no, don't, no, over here. Yep, solid as Sears. Well, Sears is very solid. Um, but, you know, d- yeah, don't touch it there because, you know, your finger pokes right through. Um, That's what whitewash is is about. It's plastering over the surface of things so that things look better. It's the opposite of elbow grease. It's not roll up your sleeve, let's fix everything. It's things are fixed. See, it's fine. It's fine. How is everything? Fine. (laughs) How's your moral life? Fine. Yeah, no, no, smooth it over, and I'm doing all the things on the outside that look good. See, I'm fine. No moral cracks at all. Whitewash can be a strategy. The fact is, they were threatened by moral decay. Our nation is threatened by moral decay. Our lives are threatened by moral decay. We live in the nation and we can't escape the influence. I don't care how committed you are. And what we can do then is whitewash. Everything's fine. Uh, Look what God says. I looked for a man among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so that I would not have to destroy it, but I found none. What God was saying, I wanted somebody to be still. Stop whitewashing. 
I wanted somebody to talk to me. God, would you do in us and in our land and in my life those things that only you can do? See, we can't really talk to God until there's a stillness and we understand, be still and know that I am God. And as God, guess what? He can deal with moral ills. He can do that. But sometimes we're so busy whitewashing and, and making ourselves look good so people smile and we live in the light of other people's, oh, what a great person we are, that we don't be still. Too busy polishing the windows to be still. Too busy looking the part. Too busy to be still. Too busy with elbow grease. Too busy with whitewash. Too busy to be still and to know that He is God. He can protect us from moral danger. He can protect us from mortal danger. He says, be still. In fact, that's what He's telling you. That's what He's telling me. There's some things that seem to really hold what it is that God would want to say. And this is one of them. And I think it's for us. I don't know what you're facing. Be still and know that I am God. That's what he would say. Be still and know that I am God. Talk to me. I looked for a man who would stand in the gap, but I found one. They were too busy fixing things to talk to me. Um, he doesn't just say, be still and know that I am God. He says, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. I love the way these two things intersect. Could you say them again? Start with be still and know that I am God. And add this one to it. One, two, three. I'll tell you what, folks, that works. That works. Be still and know that I am God. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. I dare say you let that occupy a bigger place in your brain and it will influence you. It will. It influences me when I remember it. That's why we're in the middle of a summer to remember. There's all kinds of things to occupy our mind. We have to pull these things into our mind. Allow them to have bigger and bigger places. That's why I wrote these things on the back. And these last two, critical. Commit them to memory. Meditate on them. And they'll, you find they'll get bigger and bigger. Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Um, but it says, the context for this verse, it says, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. They were about to go into the promised land. They spent 40 years wandering around in the wilderness. Moses is about to die. And add the, first, the last time they tried to get into the promised land was 39 years earlier and they got their tail kicked. So they had to walk around in circles for 39 years. That generation had died. Now a new generation is about to go in. And there are big people in this promised land. And what God indicates, you're going to go in, and you're going to go in the promised land, and you're going to face some things that are troublesome. There are giants in the land. And what he told them is, but listen to me, I will go with you. And never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Again, he's telling them, you know what, you're going to face something threatening. But as you face that thing that's threatening, what you need to know is that I will be with you as you face that threatening thing. I'm not going to allow you to stay in a place where you don't face threat, where you have what you want. God says, I will not allow it. But you need to know that as you face these uncertain things, be still and know that I am God. Never will I fail you. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. So as you face those scary things, that's what I need you to remember, God would say. People will leave you or forsake you. And that happened. When they went into the land, there were people that did not do what God wanted them to do, but God didn't fail them, leave them, or forsake them. People will. I don't care how close the people that are closest to you are. They're not God. As much as you depend on them for security, for a sense of safety, what God would say, 
Never will I leave you or forsake you. And people can say, I'll always be there for you, but the fact is that it's not a thing we can do for one another. When people leave us, we feel very unsure and uncertain. When somebody significant is not in a position of availability, it feels very threatening. We feel very unsafe. What God would say, be still. They're not God, I am. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And he's asking us to trust him in the presence of conflict, not in the absence of it. Sometimes we feel like if I do it well enough, God will protect me from conflict in my family, conflict in my life, conflict in my job, conflict in my life, what am I doing wrong? God says, nothing. Conflict in my family, what am I doing wrong? Nothing. It's not God's will to protect us from conflict. It's God's will to reveal himself to us in the midst of it. And what he asks us to do as we encounter it is to remember, be still and know that I am God. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. He wants us to trust him. And he won't insulate us from problems. There's other things we do. Look what it says the next verse. Keep your lives free from the love of money. Be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? It's interesting. That verse was used the last time when they were going to be confronted by Hittites, Hivites, Jebusites, all kinds of ites, and they were big. (laughs) And they were tough. They they were, oh gosh, uh, violent And in facing them, they're going to confront some people that are dangerous. And that's why he says, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Now in the New Testament, you know what it it describes as the threat? What does it say? The love of money is a threat. Why? Because when we're facing trouble, if we have a pocket full of cash, we feel safe. I don't need to be still because of who God is, I can be still. Have you seen my insurance plan? I'll tell you what, I'd be still. Of course I can be still. Let me tell you about my 401k. Let me tell you about my ERA. Be still. I have it made. And what God says, money will leave you or forsake you. It will. And what he says, money is not God. That's, but money, God, money makes God-like claims. Money says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And what God says, I am God. And that can constitute a threat. He says, as you face trouble, now you will need money. But be still first. Again, work. You have to work. The Bible tells us work hard. If you don't work and expect to, you know, and if you're not disabled, if you know what I mean. There were people down in that time when they thought the Lord was coming back and they felt, well, I'm not going to work anymore. God's coming back. And Paul writes, no, get to work so that you have something with which to put food on the table and with which to give other people who have needs. Work is important. It's something that God gives us to do. However, it's not the basis of our security. It's not be still, you have a good job. Be still and know that I am God. It's not be still because you have a great retirement plan. It's be still and know that I am God. People, or it's, it's not, I can be still because I have a great social network. No, be still and know that I am God. People will leave or forsake you. Money will leave or forsake you. God's the only one that will never leave or forsake you. Ask the worship team to come up at this time. He said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. People will leave and forsake you. And because of this, here's what you need to know this morning. God would have you know, and some of you are grieving the loss of people. What God would say to you is what? You tell me. Say it. Say it again. Be still and know that I am God. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. People abandoning you. Be still and know that I am God. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Sometimes it's money that leaves and forsakes. Some of you are in financial distress. 
and you really don't know about the future, it looks scary. Well, God would say, be still and know that I am God. Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Are you in the midst of some money problems? There'll be some strategies that you'll need to employ. There'll be some work. But the first thing to do is to remember. Remember this verse. Say it one more time. Both verses together. You have money issues? One, two, three. People will leave and forsake you. Money will leave and forsake you. God will never, never leave and forsake you. Peaceful, we feel peaceful inside. Things look dangerous. We become very driven, very fast, very busy. You tell us that you would have us to be still and know that you're God. Would you help us to do that? Would you help us to bring verses like this to memory so that they begin to have a bigger and bigger place in our mind? They are not just things to think. They are weapons, you tell us. They're things whereby we can clear out a place for you. It says in your word that they had no place for your word. Would you make a place for your word in our minds? Even these verses, be still and know that I am God. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Would you allow these things to have a bigger place in our minds so that when we're confronted by mortal danger or moral danger, whether it's things outside or natural catastrophes or social chaos, Give us the wherewithal to be able to see with the eyes of faith. Not that we don't do things, but we do them with stillness inside, not driven us. Help us in Jesus' name. Amen.